So thanks for having me here. I was somewhat reluctant, actually, very. Uh, Robert and I had a few interchanges about why I needed to tell this sad story again. Uh, he assures me maybe there might be one person in the country who didn't hear about the biggest aquatic biosecurity incident in its history. So um, I'm here just to take you through what happened to us and what has happened since. So <coughs> this is um, Rocky Point Prawn Farm, our first incarnation. My husband's family, German settlers, um, settled in this area halfway between Brisbane and the Gold Coast 150 years ago. It was swamp land, unusable for any sort of farming. They put irrigation systems in and they turned it into viable sugarcane land and off they went. Really proud history of farming in that area. When it was time for my husband to go to university, the family said the heydays in cane are over, so go and find something else to do. And he loved everything water, so he went to the very first aquaculture course in the country. Um, and we slowly basically converted the sugar cane lands into prawn farms. So in that time, we did a lot of very exciting things. Paul Patrick has seen me come with my hand and cap in hand numerous times. So we've done a lot of R&D research. We basically helped write the um, textbook on prawn farming, paid a lot of money for the pleasure of doing that as well. We've done a lot of R&D um, partnerships. So with CSIRO, basically, we learned how to recirculate water, which then comes back into the story a lot later on. Basically, how do you grow prawns without having to take water in more than once from the ocean, clean it up yourself? Again, apologies for the dumbed down explanations. Um, with the Australian Institute of Marine Science, we did a lot of work on basically how to get the mother prawn to lay eggs when we want her to. So that involves some really interesting techniques that were pioneered in Australia. With James Cook University, we did a lot of work because energy is our greatest cost farm about um, the variable drive motors that go into our paddle wheels, which provide oxygen for the prawns. We did um, a bit of work with University of Queensland and the United Nations Food Cleaner Production Food. Um, and we developed the first ISO 14001 QA, um, environmental accreditation, first in the world to achieve that. We um, were major exporters as well. So we were the largest exporter of Australia for a very unique species of prawn called the Japonicus, which can survive alive out of water for up to 24 hours, developed that technology as well. So everything was going really well for 30 years. This is our hatchery. So this is the other half of our operation. So we breed baby prawns and fish out of there, or we did. Um, we supplied, we're the largest independent supplier, we were. And um, we not only supplied Australian farms, but also restocking programs for state fisheries. Um, we also exported as far afield as to Canada, Chile, Israel, the United States. And um, that was all going really well as well. And this is the inside, that's the baby corn We corn's detected are. white spot in farms that went to quarantine and now we're chlorinating them. With the $360 million prawn industry at risk, the Agriculture Minister called a press conference. It was only yesterday that uh, it was made aware to me that we also detected white spot in imported green prawns. So uh, I've had the meeting with the department and now we are going to suspend the importation of green prawns. That was um, part of the Four Corners program. I think I'll just show the next slide as well. Michael Jurek knows all about gaming the system because he used to do it himself. As a mobile quarantine inspector crisscrossing Western Sydney, Jurek was left on his own to police food importers. A decade ago, he began collecting secret payments from those very importers to help them navigate Australia's biosecurity defences. And he kept it all very quiet. Well, you were holding out to these businesses the opportunity of inside information. Correct. And the, and the reason you didn't tell your bosses in the department about your moonlighting is because you knew you'd be stopped and you wanted the money. Uh, I knew I'd be stopped, but yeah, I did like helping importers and I did like that sort of things. And um, yeah, I mean, the, the money was reasonably good at the time. You took almost $200,000 from importers in a corrupt arrangement, didn't you? Um, well, some, some would view corrupt, but um, yes, I did take um, 
that amount of money, but that was over a eight-year period. Two years ago, Michael Jurek pleaded guilty to corrupt conduct. He says he regrets what he's done and claims there were other corrupt officers in the department's ranks. I believe that there was um, other officers that were either taking money for financial benefit in regards to um, providing information to importers or actually threatening importers from losing their quarantine licences. Cut that short because I have the magic five minute. Okay. So basically I'll just um, leave it there. So um, November 20... 16 was the very first outbreak. We were the last of the seven farms on the Logan River to fall. We had actually managed to last to nearly harvest time. And going back to that story about CSIRO, we believe that that early work that we did, where we basically moved water around the farm, stopped taking any more water in from the wild, enabled us to survive for so long. We don't know for sure how we ended up getting it because um, conventional wisdom is that that should have but we will leave it there. Um, so basically, this is just a quick summary of what it cost, how many. So as um, a few of the results of that is that we were put under a two-year moratorium. We were not allowed to prawn farm again. We were not allowed to move any live product out of um, any uncooked product, actually, out of the control zone. There were new um, biosecurity regulations brought in to de-risk people using contaminated bait. So no fishing within 100 metres of any prawn farm channel. So what did we do as a result? Um, we had a family meeting and we decided that we would stop farming only at a time of our own choosing and not as a result of this circumstance. And so we decided that we might go into fish farming and um, just have a little play for two years. We um, were really cognizant of the fact that we had a really incredible team of people that we've trained for 20 years and we didn't want to leave them what, um, out there for two years floating around trying to find a job. So on top of that as well, we had always wanted to have a bit of a play around with fish. So um, the two species that were chosen were very simple. The reasons we chose the Queensland giant groper and the cobia were because they were basically bred in Queensland by the Queensland government, we had access to fingerlings. It was as simple as that. This is a very small part of our footprint. So, never done a fish, fish, fish photo shoot before. This is feeding time. So basically what happened was um, we used the uh, assistance funds that we received from the Commonwealth as well as um, getting a concessional loan from the state government as well as asking the kind Dr Hone here to assist us with um, technical as well as some financial um, help to devise the um, trial. So basically what we're trialling is very simple. Um, can first of all the cobia survive in temperatures this far down south? We weren't sure about that. Um, what would they look like? Would the um, growth rate be too slow? We didn't know the answer to that. Can we overwinter them inside and then um, put them outside and what would they look like? So because it's a fledgling industry, once again, we're writing the textbooks. There's no baseline, so I have no data and graphs to show you because we're creating that as we speak. Apologies, Robert. Maybe in three years' time we'll have something to show that's a bit more interesting that, than that. Here's the Queensland giant groper. So the market opportunity for us there was that it's a protected species, so you can't buy a wild-caught version of this product. However, it's had a very um, checkered um, history in the market. There have been several operators who have um, basically hit the same roadblock that we did, which was um, the notavirus. So they've come and gone, and the marketplace as a result was scarred. So when we went to market with our first product, no one wanted to touch it because they asked, will you be here tomorrow? Or will you just disappear one day like everybody else did? So in response to that problem, I went back to the kind of Dr. Hone and said, we have this issue. What can we do about that? 
Um, very fortunately, we had some friends at UQ and JCU who have been looking at um, developing a vaccine. So um, also with the um, assistance of um, Senator Colbeck's office as well, thank you very much. Um, we managed to apparently achieve a miraculous um, turnaround time in getting an emergency approval from APVMA. A uh, vaccine was created at UQ. And here are the fish getting inoculated. In January this year, we did suffer another notice um, notavirus event, and I'm happy to report that instead of 60 to 70 percent losses, which is what we occurred last year, we only suffered a 10 percent loss. So thank you very much. The future is looking bright. Um, for us, the um, fish has had incredible market acceptance. So um, here are some of the those of you who are familiar with Instagram. We've basically um, had to be um, Instagram tarts, unfortunately. <laughs> here are some of the um, hero pics from Instagram. Um, my poor waistline has suffered from a year of having to go and visit all these chefs and talk to them about our product. Um, but um, really, really bowled over by the market acceptance. This is the holy grail for us, the export market. This is the, this is the groper. It's grown in Taiwan and in China. Now, as part of our study tour there, what we found out was that um, the reason they're very interested in the Queensland product is because they have diminishing returns from their farms there because of increasing environmental degradation. They use every part of the grope, but this was really eye-opening for us. So the profit margins for them are incredible if they can achieve a sized fish like that without having recurring virus events. Which brings me to the next point. This is not a legal product. It should not be sold in Australia. But it is. And we've complained numerous times and nothing has been done about it. And so if other players enter the market and they don't have the, va the um, vaccine, which they won't for the next three years, they'll also get no virus. So we still have challenges and they're not in our control. And this is why we should not allow imported prawns or fish into the country. This is the largest region in Taiwan for aquaculture. These are the inlet and outlet pipes for all the farms in the region. Our tour guide said this is the world center for diseases that they export all over the world. So we still face some challenges in the prawn industry as well. We are still battling the import risk assessment. We continue with our line that we should have the same risk as the pork and the chicken industries, which is no uncooked product in this country. We face the same issue as well with the cod. We would like to see that issue addressed and I will be taking it further up the line for sure. Um, but I would like to acknowledge the, um, the incredible support that we've had and the incredible collaboration that been, we've been able to achieve in the two short years that we've been in operation. Now, I hope to come back in a few years' time and tell you we're actually profitable, because that would really be the icing on the cake. But um, in the meantime, it's, it's been a wild ride, and it, it's been informative to, say, to see how Canberra works and um, how key collaborations can really result in good commercial outcomes for us. So thank you very much.